Community Affairs Director for the city, Cindy Stewart. But my project was to bring the DIA inside out here to Troy. So um, we're very excited. We had the art in 2012, and now we got accepted again for the grant in 2017. So this program is all because of the artwork that's outside of the library, and I hope you have all looked at it. We have nine paintings around Troy, so hopefully everyone will go check them all out. You can go to our website at troymi.gov inside out. But tonight, the presentation is inspired by the painting out front 14th Street at 6th Avenue by American artist John Sloan. Uh, the painting was created in 1934 as part of the Public Works of Art project by the Works Progress Administration. It depicts a bustling street scene in Manhattan during the post-depression era. And um, it's at the DIA, but the replica is right outside. So we all know what makes a great street when we see one, but what elements are critical to make a street vibrant and purposeful? So to answer that question for us, our speaker tonight is Rod Arroyo. He's a partner and director of community planning for Giffels Webster, a consulting firm with offices in Detroit, Birmingham, and Washington Township. Rod has a Master of City Planning degree from Georgia Tech and has over 35 years of community planning and transportation experience. He's a frequent speaker and author on planning and transportation topics, and he has served as adjunct faculty for Wayne State University's Graduate Urban Planning Program. His experience includes master plans, zoning ordinances, corridor studies, and transportation plans. He directed the preparation of the city of Troy's Big Beaver Corridor Study, which captured, captured an outstanding planning project award in 2008 from the Michigan Association of Planning. His downtown master plan for the city of Clawson was recognized with the 2017 Vernon Dennis Award for an outstanding special plan by the American Planning Association Small Town Division. Rod's traffic and transportation experience includes assessing the traffic impact, impacts of such large-scale projects as the Palace of Auburn Hills, former home to the Detroit Pistons, and Hard Rock Stadium, home of the Miami Dolphins. Rod's also a photographer. He's serving as principal photographer for the upcoming book, A History Lover's Guide to Detroit, by the History Press, which is scheduled for publication later this year. And I had the pleasure of working him when I was, we were both city of Novi, and then now the city of Troy. So it's my pleasure to introduce Rod Arroyo. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you, everybody coming out tonight uh, to hear this presentation. I'm very excited about the DIA's Inside Out program. I have enjoyed seeing the artwork all over Metro Detroit. Um, I have to admit, I've never been asked to do a presentation that ties city planning and transportation to a, a work of art at the, at the DIA. So when I was asked uh, to take that on, I said, well, sure, why not? You know, it'll be something unique and different. Um, I'm not an expert in art, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on the art side of this, but we are going to talk about city streets, uh, what makes them great, and what makes them congested. So what I thought I'd do is start off by giving you an idea of what we're going to cover in this presentation. Uh, I think we do need to start off by talking about that inspiring work of art. So we'll talk about that briefly. Then I'm going to get into our city streets, what makes them great. We're going to talk about some of the ingredients of a, of a great street. Uh, I want to have a brief overview of the Big Beaver Corridor study because I thought it might be helpful to tie some of these elements to the work that was done with that particular study. And then uh, finally, we're going to get into our streets, what makes them congested. So we're going to um, dive into that topic. So that's that's our outline for this evening. I thought it might be helpful to start off um, by setting the, um, the, our bearings for the, this work of art that we're looking at um, that's hanging right outside here. Uh, this is, um, we're looking at bas basically the north side of Greenwich Village in Manhattan. This is Washington Square. New York University is here. My son just graduated from there um, just this past spring. He, the Stern School of Business is right here. He got his business degree, so I'm very familiar with this general location. This is Union Square. This is um, 14th Street and 6th Avenue, and the painting we're looking at is right at that intersection. So just to uh, give you a little bearing about the location, because I think that's helpful. All right, so here it is, 14th Street at 6th Avenue, 1934. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, this was funded by the federal government with the Works Progress Administration, which was part of the New Deal to bring the country out of the, the Great Depression. 
Um, artists could earn about $45 a week if they were an established artist and they agreed to actually produce work. Um, they could make money uh, and they could be paid for it. And all the work they created was owned to be owned by the federal government. Interesting story about this is that it was in a senator's office in the late 1930s. He left office. One of the staff members thought it was just something he could take, took it home. <laughs> And it disappeared for a while. And I think it almost ended up in a garbage can at some point, And it was rescued uh, within the last uh, seven years. And the federal government's going out and trying to find all these lost works, the ones, and saying, hey, we want them back in the public eye. And so I think it's pretty much on a permanent loan to the DIA. And the DIA is, is really the caretaker of this, of this piece right now. But it's a bustling street scene. I'm going to go into some details about it in a second. I thought we'd talk about um, the artist, John Sloan. Um, he was really known for his ability to capture street life. He, that, was, that was really his passion as an artist. Um, he created these images from memory. He, would, he had his, his studio just north in the Chelsea uh, area of, of Manhattan. And he would walk the streets. And he would create these from memory. He, he wasn't an artist that would set up an easel in the street and, and create that way. Uh, so he, um, he was a founder of the Ashcan School, um, which was a movement of artists looking to um, do kind of break the mold. A lot of the artists at the time were doing very formal portraits. And these artists really wanted to create more vibrant street scenes that reflected the character of the neighborhoods. And um, so he spent a lot of time in the poorer neighborhoods of New York um, creating his work. They tended to be darker in tone, more roughly painted, and you can kind of get that sense from, from this particular piece. So if we break down this piece and start to look at some of the ingredients as we think about great streets, we see some, some important features. We see some pedestrian-oriented signs that are projecting out from the facade of, of the buildings. We see a continuous street wall of window displays here. So as people walk along, they can look in, see display windows, see people dining, um, having something to look at so that you want to continue walking. Uh, we see a transit line, which is really interesting. I guess I'm not going to be able to point all the way up there. But uh, the, the transit line uh, along 14th Street, elevated, uh, it no longer exists. Uh, but it, it was there at the time, and it obviously was a very imposing structure. But that's also an important part of an urban setting. There are street vendors. We have on-street parking, another very critical element to protect pedestrians and make them feel like they're comfortable in a street setting. And we see street vendors and the like. And then an appropriate building height to street width ratio, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And oh, I wanted to, this feature up here, this turret, you notice that? Here it is today, the same street, same location. That's about the only feature that remains that you might recognize. So here we see um, the street's gotten wider. You can tell the sidewalk is not quite as wide as it was back then. But the automobile didn't have the same presence as it does today, obviously. And uh, there were a lot more people walking, using the streets. Um, the inner borough rapid transit line closed in 1955. So that, that, uh, that elevated line was taken out shortly thereafter. OK, for us to talk about a great street, we need to think about what's not a great street. Okay, So if I look at these images, I would say these are not great streets. These look like streets that were designed by cars that want to move quickly, not designed for people. Even though we see uh, sidewalks in both of these streets, you have a sidewalk here, sidewalks there, who would want to walk on these sidewalks? Think about there's, there's barely a tree anywhere to be found. There's nothing of real interest. All the signs are tall. They're oriented towards the automobile. Um, you actually have automobiles for sale here with no buffer right up to the sidewalk. Um, this is a very harsh environment for a pedestrian. Even when we think about residential streets, um, when, it, when the garage comes out and it's just the garage, we call these snout houses. And we basically call these garages with attached dwellings. And <laughs> these look, this basically looks like it was done, designed by cars looking to meet other cars. Because okay? <laughs> imagine if you're walking on the street, what's the likelihood of you interacting with a neighbor? No, you're, you've got a garage door. It's closed. The entry to the house is recessed back. Um, 
this is certainly not the type of street scene that's going to encourage interaction with your neighbors. So there's a book that came out in 1993 that I think is an excellent book if you want to learn more about Great Streets, and it's called Great Streets by Alan Jacobs. And these are some of his words. I thought I'd quote them because I think um, they, they're very relevant to what we're talking about today. First and foremost, a great street should help make community. It should facilitate people acting and interacting to achieve in concert what they may not achieve alone. The best streets will be those where it is possible to see other people and to meet them, all kinds of people, not just of one class or color or age. A great street should be a most desirable place to be, to spend time, to live, to play, to work, at the same time that it markedly contributes to what a city should be. The best streets encourage participation. People stop to talk, or maybe they sit and watch as passive participants, taking in what the street has to offer. The best streets are those that can be remembered. It can stand for others. It is the best. To have achieved that status, it will have been put together well, artfully. So I think that's a great description of what a, a street should, should be. And I want to tell you a story about an impromptu conversation. Um, my Detroit office is right near Grand Circus Park. And I try to go out when the weather is good in the summertime and, and walk uh, when I can. And I happen to be just south of Grand Circus Park on Woodward Avenue. And some of you may remember the Sanders store. And you may have seen this pop up in the last couple of weeks. It was uncovered. They're doing some renovations. And I just pulled out my phone, decided to take a picture. And um, this man happened to be standing outside. He was taking, a, it looks like he was taking a cigarette break. And he saw me taking the picture. And he came up to me and he said, um, you know, I live in these senior apartments here. And um, when I look at this facade, I think back to the way Detroit was in the 1960s, the bustling street scene. And he just had a big smile on his face. And he said, you know, I've lived in this apartment for about 15 years. And three years ago, when he looked across the street, all of these storefronts and everything I look at was empty. And now look at it. And you know, most of the storefronts now along Woodward are full. And things are really happening. Things are changing. Things are becoming more vibrant many people walking in the streets again. And um, we had a conversation, we, and we went on for a few minutes more, and we just kind of looked at each other and smiled, and I said, you know, have a great day, you have a great day. And it was, it was a really great conversation, and it's the type of conversation and an interaction that you will never have when you're in a car, okay? You have to be on the street, you have to be where you have something interesting to talk about. You can't be on one of those streets that we saw in the first slide that's not very interesting. You have to, here we had something to talk about. And it's an interaction, and, and, it, and it, I think it can have a significant impact on the way people view other people when they're able to have those types of impromptu interactions. So when we're talking about great streets, we also want to think about, are there special ingredients? And, and in fact, there are. There's physical elements that help define a great street and make it a great street and make it so a pedestrian feels comfortable. And one of the things we want to look at is the ratio of street width, and when we talk about street width, we really mean from building face to building face to building height. And the most desirable ratio to create a, a positive pedestrian experience is a one-to-one -one ratio, where the building height to the distance between the buildings across the street is the same distance. A one-to-two ratio is also desirable. As a matter of fact, a one-to-three and one-to-four are generally considered to be acceptable. It's when you hit the one to five ratio and it gets larger that those buildings get farther and farther apart, you lose that feeling as a pedestrian that you're actually in a place where pedestrians belong. So this is a typical suburban scenario. You would have 120 feet of right of way in the middle and then you'd have a 70 foot setback which would give you one double loaded bay of 90 degree parking and then a building. And that's what you end up with. You end up with a 1 to 15 ratio. That's not the type of ratio that's going to make a pedestrian feel comfortable. But that's a very suburban ratio. So let's take a look at some example of the local street. This is downtown Birmingham. Probably many of you are familiar with Old Woodward. We're right at Maple. 
from building face to building face is 100 feet. The two-story component here is about 30, 33 feet. So we have a one to three ratio right here in, in downtown Birmingham. And if you go down where the buildings are taller, the four to five story, we get closer to a one to two ratio. So it's a very, it feels very comfortable as a pedestrian in downtown Birmingham as you stroll. One of the most famous streets in the world, the Champs-Élysées in Paris. It's about 229 feet from building face to building face. Building height, somewhere in the area of seven stories, uh, 75 feet, guess what? It's a one to three ratio. Same ratio as we just saw in Birmingham, but at a much grander scale. So even though we're moving 10 lanes of traffic through the heart of this street, doesn't feel very pedestrian friendly. Here it has the elements and it has the, the ratio and the street elements that we're gonna talk about that make pedestrians feel comfortable. Um, same street, I took this picture about 9.30 at night, loaded with pedestrians, loaded with activity. You would never know you've got 10 lanes of traffic next to this because of the, of the elements that are here, this, the physical elements, the trees, the awnings, the signage, the sidewalks, the outdoor dining, the ratio of the building to the street width, all of those things come into play to make pedestrians feel welcome. Same thing in downtown Birmingham. You feel very welcome. You've got a lot of the same key elements. You have on-street parking to, to protect the pedestrians. You've got landscape elements. You've got a street wall. You've got um, continuous um, open glass areas to look into. You have signs that are oriented. We see some umbrellas. We're outdoor dining up ahead. Same type of environment. And if we look elsewhere in Michigan, this is Marquette in the UP. This happens to be a street, Washington Street, it's 66 feet wide from building face to building face. So with a two-story building, you get the one to two ratio rather quickly. And when you go up to four stories, um, you can get even closer to, a, to an even better ratio. So it doesn't take long to start to see how these ratios can be reflected in the towns that we know and the places we probably feel comfortable walking. This is Beverly Hills, California. This is a pedestrian street. This is, um, no vehicles are allowed here. But when we start to take a look at the elements, we see pedestrian scale lights. We see pedestrian signs, signs that are oriented to the pedestrian. The continuous street wall with the open glass areas to look in, the flowers, the plantings, benches, textured pavement. This is a street that's not only walkable, it's sitable. You feel comfortable sitting and just observing, taking in the, the street life or you can walk and stroll. You have those choices. And we're going back to um, the quote we heard earlier, the best streets encourage participation. People stop to talk, or maybe they sit and watch as passive participants taking in what the street has to offer. <coughs> so when we break down some of those other elements that make a street, the type of street that a person's going to feel comfortable, we, we clean sidewalks, certainly. And those sidewalks do need to be buffered from through traffic. People, particularly if traffic is moving at higher speeds, they're not gonna feel comfortable walking without some type of physical buffer between them. On-street parking is usually the best way to do that, but sometimes you can't have on-street parking and you can have other buffers uh, that can take the place of that. Um, Paris was an example where we really don't have the on-street parking, but we have landscaping and wide areas that, uh, that help to, to, to provide that level of protection. Continuous street wall, we've talked about that. The pedestrian scale design, architecture, street furnishing, signage, public art, lighting. The lights are brought down. They're not way high up in the, in the air like you would light a, uh, an open street area. They're down at the level where pedestrians feel like um, it's there for them. Uh, you've got um, architecture where the, the building openings are all scaled to the pedestrian level. They're not scaled like a big box store. It's scaled so when you stand in front of it, it's like, this is for me, this is for a person. Um, this, this, is, this is designed for people. Um, and then pedestrian elements like awnings, canopies, um, street trees, other things that protect you from the elements. All these things can protect you when it's raining or snowing so that even though you're outside, you still can have a, a, an experience you feel comfortable about and hopefully you'll continue that stroll. 
And we look at a continuous street wall, it's not what we see on the left. That building's all the way up to the, the road right of way, which is generally desirable, but it, there's no character here. Um, the windows have been boarded up. If you're walking past this, would you keep walking? Why would you want to walk and, and have that experience? On the right, totally different. You've got a very lively um, uh, display window. You've got some outdoor merchandise. Uh, it looks like the store next door is also very interesting. You've got a place for a bicycle to, to, to park. Uh, you've got, there's a lot going on here. You have some, some flowers. This is a place where you'd feel comfortable and you'd want to keep strolling. Great streets have to have places that are authentic. This is not authentic. This is an attempt by someone to make a fake downtown facade. And when we start to, to break this down, you can see there's no people here. Um, you know, you've got this bizarre change in roof line. You've got the, the bricks happen to go right up to the side of a window and then change brick style. The, the, the proportion of the windows um, makes no sense. It doesn't have the proper, proper scale or rhythm. Um, this, is, this is really not um, authentic in any way. This is authentic. You, know, you, you look at it and you immediately say, yeah, I'd like to walk here. Uh, this is downtown Marshall, Michigan. Um, you've got the open storefronts. You've got landscaping. You've got on-street parking. You've got street trees. You've got signs that are oriented more towards pedestrian than, than vehicles. All those elements are there. And this feels like an authentic, real place um, that was not artificially manufactured to try to pretend to be something it's not. Retailers only have about five to eight seconds to engage a passerby as they walk past the storefront. If you don't have a lively storefront window, you will likely just keep walking. It's not interesting. So um, you can do that by having goods that are appropriate dis appropriately displayed, or you can have dining. People like to see other people. They like to see people dining. Um, outdoor dining, is. this is a great example. This is uh, downtown Ferndale. This is Como's and you've got people dining right by the sidewalk, you can actually be out for a nightly walk and see a neighbor or a friend that's dining and you engage in a conversation. It's social interaction, once again, something that would never happen if you're both in an automobile. Another thing about great streets that's very important, and, I, and we start to think about this, I think you're gonna, it's, I think it, the essence of your five senses being um, part of the street experience. Um, Sean Souter is a, uh, is a land use attorney and a zoning expert that I met in New York and he recently had a post about the five senses and I, I've, I've taken some of, the, some of his thoughts as part of these, these next few slides because I thought he really, uh, really nailed the uh, appropriateness of how we view the senses when we're in a, in a great street. Starting with sight. That's the first impression whether it be engaging architecture creative signage, landscaping, the siting of buildings, even the quality of the paving is essential to engage the most powerful sense of sight. So that's the, likely the first thing that might um, attract you to a particular area. It could be something else, but quite often it's sight. Smell. A street can smell awful, or it can be amazing. It could be the aroma of flowers. It can be food being cooked or grilled or somehow prepared something else that might attract you to a store. Hearing, the sounds of people talking and music playing can make a street come alive and really make it feel special. Or honking horns and traffic noise can detract from that experience. Taste, smell or aroma can either repulse you or lead you to something. If you can then taste something that smells wonderful, it becomes a reward and an experience, something that's part of that downtown um, stroll and part of that downtown um, participation in all of the different elements. Touch. Touch is the implementation of sight. Online sales lack one key thing that bricks and mortar sales offer, the ability to engage through touch. How many times have you been in a retail sales situation and the salesperson hands you the product and says, here, hold it. You know, they're trying to get you to touch it, to engage with it, because that becomes a very powerful experience that you can't get online. So a lot of retail stores in, a, in great street settings are actually thriving because they offer a high level of service 
and they offer the ability for people to touch the products and engage in that way. So if you can be um, really good at providing customer service and you can provide a quality product and let people experience it, experience it firsthand, you can compete with the less expensive retailers that may be selling through the internet. So just to summarize these streets for people, pedestrian friendly atmosphere, artfully designed and authentic, mixed uses that work well together. A traditional great street is going to have ground floor retail, it's going to have ground floor restaurants, but on the upper floors it's going to have offices, it's going to have residential, it's going to have population that's there 24 hours a day. Connectivity to other parts of the community, we want people to be able to go from the neighborhoods to these types of streets through a a variety of different transportation modes. You might want to drive there sometime, you might want to walk, you might want to ride a bike. You want to have those opportunities to take those different um, transportation modes. You appeal to all of the senses and you have coordinated programs and events to keep drawing people back. Okay, I was, the, I was on the street, I had a great experience and I, I think I've seen everything and then all of a sudden you hear, oh, they have a, a new event, they have a concert, they have an, an art display, there's a reason for you to go back. That coordinated program and events keeps you coming back for more in those authentic places. So when we get back to this slide of our, of our garages with attached dwellings, well, this is an example of a dwelling with an attached garage. Here is a place where the garage is clearly um, something that is not presented to the street. It's recessed from the street. There is a porch in the front. There's the ability for someone to actually be sitting on the porch and engage with somebody walking by. Um, this type of single family architecture is the type that will build communities. This will build places where cars can get into their garages very quickly. I can't not talk about complete streets. I'm not gonna, I could spend the entire evening talking about complete streets, but I think it's important uh, to at least recognize that streets are more than just roads that move traffic. We talked about this a little bit. We want to provide for all the different users of the road system, whether you be a motorist, a bicyclist, a walker, someone with disabilities, a transit rider. All of those folks have a role on the street. And we're starting to see more and more of that with pavement markings. You've probably seen these around where all of a sudden you're seeing the bicyclists in particular are getting very dynamic um, striping so that you know bicyclists have a place on the road. Okay, this is where they go. You can respect that as a, as a motorist. And we're starting, and we have a place for pedestrians. We have a place where transit goes. All of those things start to become very evident when you tell people that other users have a place on the road. When we just have a 10 lane road with a narrow sidewalk on either side, it just seems like it's a place where vehicles will go. When you see this road, you know this is a place where others may go. That, have, that are other users. So the street's more than a road, it does, it's a right of way. By state law now, communities have to consider complete streets planning when they do their community master plans. So we've had a change um, in the last 10 years and so as we, as we look at our communities when we're doing long range planning, we have to think about all the different users of the street network. It doesn't mean that every road is going to accommodate every user. What it means is, you need to comprehensively consider how all users of the network can flow, have excellent connectivity, and have the ability to change transportation modes as they move about the community. All right, I'm gonna now give you a brief overview. I, as I mentioned earlier, um, I directed the Big Beaver Corridor study back in 2006. It was a great project, probably one of the highlights of my career. Um, enjoyed working with, uh, we, we had lots of public input, we, we worked with business owners, we worked with um, property owners, um, working with um, the Downtown Development Authority, worked with the Planning Commission, with Council, uh, and really the, the City of Troy came to us and said, we want Big Beaver to be a world-class boulevard. And that was the main purpose of why this, this study was done. So what I thought I would do, Let's go through some of the highlights and show you how some of those elements relate to some of the other discussions we've had this evening. Um, so when you talk about a world-class boulevard, you need to define what is a world-class boulevard. So we did that with some important statements here that I think help, to, help to, to, to narrow it down and focus it for this particular boulevard. 
World Class Boulevard, they're regional, they're national, they're worldwide destinations. They're authentic, timeless, and they create long-term value. They're vibrant, interactive people places. They are all season, day and night, working, living, community experiences. They're a diverse mix of components and shared uses. They celebrate the role of architecture, landscape, and civic art as placemakers. They generate human interaction. They're not suburban, they're not automobile dominant. They utilize public transit of some sort, and they are simply places people want to be. We talked about certain experiential moments you would have if you're on a world-class boulevard. You'd have highlighted gateways. When you go into a place that's special, there's usually a, a sense of arrival. There's some type of, of physical gateway or some type of change in the character of the road that tells you it's time to slow down. It's time, this is a place where there are going to be pedestrians, where this is going to be a different experience. And you do that by having some type of marked um, gateway into a, a, a change of your community, um, community pattern. Drastically staged boulevard, iconic pedestrian bridges. One of the concepts was to build on the bridge that was created for the Somerset Collection. And if there were going to be other pedestrian bridges, have them be iconic, have them be subject to a design competition so that that could be something people might come to, the, to this corridor to see these bridges. So that was, that was part of the plan. Large public areas, nighttime is magic, one of a kind, where you can stroll and have some, a reason to be there and a reason to experience the boulevard at night. Um, the walk experience is celebrated. It becomes something, as we talked about before, something more of a stroll than a walk that you're just trying to get through to get it over with. World-class residential and retail, so that mixing of uses. Pocket parks, ample green space, building architecture defines the space. And I-75 gateway becomes a forested portal. The idea was that the I-75 interchange, which is right in the middle of the Big Beaver corridor, would be heavily planted similar to the Washington DC Beltway. So that if you came off the freeway, there would be all these trees and you would say, wow, I'm in a place that's totally different. I need to slow down and realize that this is a special corridor. So that was part of what we were looking for with that. One of the things we did is we studied parking. I, I, I find this to be fascinating. All of this gray space is parking along the corridor. Here's Coolidge, here's Crooks, I-75. And a lot of that parking was out in front of buildings. So as you drive by, it's a, it's a really, it's a beautiful suburban corridor, but when you look at all the parking lots in the front, that's what you would see as you drive by. You would just see parking. And we wanted to rethink that. One of the things we did is looked at one of the things that the corridor is doing right. And when you look at the Somerset Collection and the use of structured parking, it's really a thing of beauty because we did a comparison between 12 Oaks Mall and the Somerset Collection. 12 Oaks Mall, within the Ring Road, has 102 acres of parking and access. That's when you take out the building. It's just 102 acres of parking and access. You compare that with Somerset Collection, it's 42 acres. They're both about 1.5 million square feet of space and both about 7,000 parking spaces. The difference is the structured parking becomes much more efficient. And the way you're able to afford structured parking is by increasing density. Um, and if you do more of that along the corridor, you're able to afford to construct on street or um, structured parking and then create this type of efficient use of land, which generates more taxes per acre when you're able to have this efficiency than you know, when you just have a parking lot, it doesn't create that much value. And this is the cross section for Big Beaver between basically from, from the Somerset Collection east to Crooks. This was the, the cross section for the boulevard that was created. When we talked to the Road Commission, we knew this going in, we were never going to be able to impede the through traffic that is currently on Big Beaver, the six lanes of, of traffic. So we said, okay, well, we're not going to do that. The concept though to create a more walkable experience was introduction of these slip streets. They would run parallel, we would have on-street parking, and then be able to create that pedestrian experience along a road with a lot of traffic. And actually, we met with the Road Commission, and they said, yeah, we, we can live with that. Obviously, these have not been built yet. It's a long-range plan. When this plan was completed, we pretty much went into the Great Recession about a year later. We, there were a lot of things happening at the time, and they, a lot of them got put on the shelf. But things are, are starting to happen, and this is still um, part of the vision. And when you look at it 
at the street level, this is what it would look like. Here would be all the traffic. Here would be the slip street, on-street parking, the walkable experience. All of that created, much like you saw with the Champs-Élysées. Um, and in fact, this is almost as wide, two, about 208 feet um, of right-of-way along Big Beaver compared to 229 for the Champs-Élysées. And then here's another sketch just illustrating how some of that could come off of the street, creating places, that entertainment-related places where people would want to be. So what's happened since the Big Beaver Corridor study? Well, the city of Troy changed their zoning code to require buildings to come up to, to the roadway, and you've seen some, some evidence. We're going to show some photographs of that. Um, there's a mix of uses permitted and encouraged. The city, some of you may have heard the Move Across Troy project, which is introducing mid-block pedestrian crossings along um, Big Beaver. Those, as I understand, are going to start construction soon. You have a shuttle service, free shuttle service, that transit's a very important element, providing alternative forms of transportation along a, a busy and world-class boulevard. So that is, is also in place, and you have the potential to, to add to, to that type of system. And here's just a couple of examples. At the time we did the study, this was um, just west of I-75, the, the north side of, of Big Beaver. Um, that was the experience. Once you get off the freeway, that's what you saw. Um, now, in fact, my wife and I had dinner here tonight. Um, it's a great place. Uh, but you can see, even though we don't necessarily have the density that would be preferred, you have a pedestrian-oriented experience. You have lighting that's for pedestrians. You have benches for pedestrians. You have outdoor dining. Um, you have uh, landscaping, pavement, all of these different um, elements that are creating something where you feel much more comfortable as a pedestrian in a location like that. This was a, um, an obsolete office building that also has now um, been replaced with, uh, with new development brought up to the roadway. Once again, we're creating pedestrian-oriented places between the buildings in this location. Um, you've got a lot of things happening here that couldn't have happened if the vision didn't change and the zoning ordinance didn't change to allow this. And hopefully as things happen, there'll be more, um, more development that matches the type of, of vision that was created in that, in that uh, corridor study. And many of you may have seen this plan. This is Bob Gibbs' plan for the town center, this area where we are right now. So these same concepts are being carried forward from the Big Beaver Corridor study into the Civic Center complex. Uh, once again, trying to provide for walkable areas, areas that make sense where you're creating great streets and great experiences for people to interact. So we talked a lot about slowing traffic down, creating this great pedestrian experience. Besides making it so that it's good for business, it's good for traffic safety. When vehicle speeds are lower, streets are safer for pedestrians. At 20 miles an hour, the risk of death to a pedestrian on foot struck by a vehicle is 6%. At 30 miles per hour, that risk of death is three times greater. At 45 miles per hour, the risk of death is 65%, 11 times greater than at 20 miles per hour. And then if you're struck by a car going 50 miles per hour, pedestrian fatality rates are 75%. Injury rates are more than 90%. So as a pedestrian, you're much more likely to um, be injured less or potentially even survive if you're in an area where the speeds are lower and you, if you happen to be hit by a vehicle. On-street parking is a critical element for great streets. We've talked about that, that buffering of pedestrians from, from moving traffic. You typically need speed limits of 35 miles per hour or lower, preferably lower, for you, able, for you to be able to get on-street parking permitted by road agencies. So, the way you change driver behavior is you start to change what's happening along the roadway, bringing the buildings in closer, increasing the roadside friction, adding those pedestrian elements, giving the visual cue to the driver that it's time to slow down. And once that happens, then you're able to get the speeds down to where it matches the pedestrian experience and you could potentially even introduce on-street parking because you, the, the speed has lowered to the point where it supports it. So now I want to transition to the congestion side of the equation. Our city streets, 
what makes them congested. Number one, we're driving a lot more. Okay, I think this, this graph is fascinating. We're comparing 1980 to 2015. In the United States, over that period of time, our population increased 41%. During that same period of time, the vehicle miles traveled by people in this country increased by 103%. Massive difference between the population growth and the change in VMT. How about the number of lane miles? How many, how about the number of lane miles? So what's, what, what do we have to work with as a motorist? Between 1981 and 2011, we had a 10% increase in the number of lane miles in this country. In that same period, we had a 92% change in vehicle miles traveled. So all those vehicle miles traveled, they're sucking up the capacity that was already there and maybe some of the new capacity that's being added. But no wonder our streets are feeling congested. We're traveling a lot more, but we haven't really added a lot more lane miles over that same period of time. We like to drive alone. Nationally, 76% of us drive alone. Transit's 5%, bike 0.6%, walking just under 3%, um, carpool just under 10%. We like to drive at the same time. This is um, I-96, profile, hourly profile of I-96. We can see that from about 5.30 to 8 a.m. and from about 2 to 5.30 p.m. in this case, that's when the peaks really occur. And if we actually look at the volume, here at 4 p.m., 14,235 vehicles. If we wait to 7 o'clock to travel, there's only 6,200 vehicles on the road. Imagine the experience of driving at 7 p.m. versus 4 p.m. This is an interesting photograph. Here we have 150 people in 103 cars or we have them in one bus. Shows you the power of driving either alone or maybe some cars might have one person with them. Takes up a lot of space, consumes a lot of, a lot of the roadway. If we take transit, we can have a significant impact on how much of that road capacity is actually available. We are spread out and we, we drive greater distances. Let's look at what's happened to developed land in this country and compare it to population growth. 1982 to 1987, U.S. population grew by about just under 5%. The acreage of developed land grew by just over 7%. We jump over here during the boom time here, 92 to 97, our population grew by just over 6%. Developed land, acreage of developed land, um, over 11%. And then once the Great Recession started to approach, things started to get a little bit more balanced the other way. But you can see, when times are good, our population was growing some, but the amount of developed land was growing a lot faster than our population was growing. That's because we were, we were building on larger acreage. We're, our, the homes we were purchasing were on larger lots. We were just consuming a lot more land. Most of our children no longer walk to school. In 1969, 48% of kindergarten to eighth grade students usually walked or bicycled to school. If you live within one mile of the school, 89% of you walked or, or took a bike in 1969. Fast forward 40 years, 2009, 13% of kindergarten to eighth grade students usually walked or biked to school. And if you were within a mile, 35%. 48% to 13%. So where did, what, why, why is this happening? Well, they did a survey and asked parents, why aren't your kids walking or biking to school? 61% said the distance to the school. 30% said traffic-related danger. Just under 19% said weather. And then under 12% said crime. I was really surprised that crime, I thought the crime number would be higher. It really isn't. It's really the distance to school is because of the way we build schools. About half of the states in this country have minimum site sizes for schools. Funding sources favor new construction over rehabilitation. Land is cheaper outside of population density. It's cheaper to get the land on the fringe of development. 
Um, and our Euclidean zoning, which is essentially our zoning which separates every land use into individual categories where we don't mix the uses, it tends to spread everything out even more. So we increase sprawl, we increase travel distances. We used to have our elementary schools in our neighborhoods and you would walk to them. Now they're built in these mega, some of these elementary schools look like community colleges almost, they're so big, and they're on major roadways. And they either, some of them don't have pedestrian walkways from the neighborhoods to them, or if they do, they're along very heavily traveled roads, there isn't that protection, and people don't necessarily feel safe walking. So what really happened? And once again, 1969 to 2009, we see this big jump in the use of the family vehicle. Um, it was low in 69, now it's really high in 2009. But look at the use of the school bus. School bus hasn't really changed. 38% were taking the bus, 39% were taking the bus 40 years later. The big change is right here, family vehicle versus walker bicycle. And what else happened during that time? 1969, 48% walk or bike to school. Obesity rate of children, 6 to 11 years old, 4.2%. We're at 13% walking or biking to school. Obesity rate of children, 6 to 11, 18.1%. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things that go into the obesity rate for children, and the, the way they get to school is not the only reason why we have an obesity issue, but it's one of the factors. That's a, that's a substantial change. Parents driving their students to school comprise about 10 to 14 percent of morning peak hour traffic and 5 to 7 percent of all vehicle miles traveled. Forty percent of parents driving their children to school returned home immediately thereafter. These are all trips that are being created on the road network because of the way we built our schools and the way um, other societal changes have occurred and we're clogging up our roads with trips that don't really have to be made in a vehicle. Many of us don't drive very well and we know better. <laughs> AAA, AAA survey, national survey in 2014, random sample of about 3,500 US residents driving 16 plus. Nearly one in five drivers have been involved in a serious crash. Nearly one in three Americans have had a friend or relative seriously injured or killed in a crash. So they, start, they ask people, okay, drinking and driving. 91% say that's completely unacceptable. 12% said they did it in the last year. 1.5% say they do it fairly often or regularly. Cell phones. 45% said it's a serious threat to use a cell phone in the car. They said it's completely unacceptable to use a handheld phone. 42% said that. And for hands-free, they said 17%. 69% th said they did it in the last 30 days. And 30, roughly 30% said they do it fairly often or regularly. How about texting and emailing while you drive? 79% said it's a serious threat. 84% said it's completely unacceptable to type texts or emails. And 27% said they typed or sent or texted an email in the last 30 days. And 36% said they read a text or an email in the past 30 days. How about speeding? 15 miles per hour over the speed limit on a freeway. 32% people said that that's a very serious threat. Almost half the people said it's completely unacceptable. 46% people said they did it in the last 30 days. 14% said they do it fairly often or regularly. How about speeding in residential streets? 10, going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. 44% said it's a serious threat. 64% said it's completely unacceptable. 43% said they did it in the last 30 days. And almost 10% said they do it often or regularly. How about running a red light? Serious threat to 55%, unacceptable to 73%. Did it in the last 30 days, 35%. Fairly often, 2%. All right, so there's a lot of talk about autonomous vehicles. Can they improve traffic flow? Can they improve safety? Well, let's look at a couple of things. I have a video I want to show you. It's pretty interesting. I have to go over here to launch it. Oops. I'm going to have to go back. There we go. Um, hmm. Interesting. In this mode, I might have to get out of this mode to do it. Hold on. 
I have to show it to you this way because it doesn't want to load. Where is my... Hmm. Well, it worked the other day when I was in here. And I don't know why it's not working. Well, it's a short video and I can describe it to you. I, I really, it worked the other day when it was here. Okay. What this does, I will describe it, I apologize. Um, this loaded back up. These universities basically took vehicles and had them go in a circle. And they measured the throughput, the number of vehicles per hour that could be handled by going in this large circle. They measured um, the uh, amount of vehicle consumption and they measured how frequently people break. And what they did was they let it just go randomly and you could see what happened. All of a sudden, you know how people are, they're not gonna all keep the perfect uh, proper distances between vehicles and someone would break and then someone behind them would break and you get that chain reaction and everybody's breaking. Well, they introduced one autonomous vehicle into it that was paced at a, a precise speed. And what happened was it, it changed the, the pattern of all the vehicles behind it because there was this consistency in the lead vehicle. The, the volume, the, the amount, the number of vehicles that could actually pass through increased the speed efficiency improved and the percent of braking dropped. And what the ultimate result is, which is here, here's the conclusion, our experiments show that with as few as 5% of vehicles being automated and carefully controlled, we can eliminate stop and go waves caused by human driving behavior. So we don't know when autonomous vehicles are gonna be fully introduced into um, our road network, but they have the potential to have a significant positive impact on traffic congestion, even if 5% of our, of our fleet becomes autonomous vehicles. Um, Audi Urban Futures Initiative looked at what's happening with auto autonomous vehicles, and um, the project manager in this case said the biggest change to the urban fabric is gonna be parking infrastructure. Um, parking will be moved indoors and outside of the city centers, freeing up outdoor lots and spaces for development in public space. Lots will be able, be able to accommodate 60% more cars thanks to smaller driving lanes, greater maneuverability, and the lack of the need for stairs and elevators. And that's really thinking about almost a 100% autonomous vehicle situation. We're really far off from that, even if it ever happens. But any level of that could potentially reduce the amount of parking that we need because people don't park the car. If you're in an autonomous vehicle, it takes you someplace, you get out, that vehicle then goes off and serves somebody else. So imagine what happens when all of a sudden we don't need that parking anymore. We can reimagine that for other spaces. We could put new development, we could turn it into parks. It could, it could the, the, the opportunities are endless in terms of what could happen with autonomous vehicles. Um, so driving lanes could become narrower, um, we could, narrow the right-of-way that we need, potentially due to more precise driving. We, would, we could see the end of, of human error in driving. Um, certain uses like car washes, gas stations, and vehicle service, they may be moved outside of the, of, the, of the developed areas into centralized hubs where these vehicles then at night go out to be serviced and then come back when they're needed when people are awake. Large fleet owners may own the majority of vehicles. Trucks and vehicles may increasingly move in large platoons. Imagine trucks that need to get from one end of the country to the other, all traveling where maybe they're only three feet apart from one another, all moving at the exact same speed with no impediments. Imagine the efficiency of the flow and how goods and services can be improved by the efficiency created by autonomous trucks and autonomous vehicles. However, we have to keep in mind, there's still gonna be a need for pickup and drop off areas. Imagine if you're at a Detroit Lions game, it gets out, you've got 70,000 people and they're all calling for the autonomous vehicle at the same time. Obviously it's not gonna work. You have all these vehicles, all of a sudden you have a traffic jam. So you're back to the whole traffic jam, traffic congestion problem. So you're still gonna to have to create these separated um, areas for drop off and pick off. You're going to have pick up. You're going to have to um, not have everybody want to use the vehicle at the exact same time. You're still going to have some of the challenges we face today with uh, with large facilities that happen to have 
a, um, a, a, a release time that's at the same time. We don't have a, um, a uh, dispersed release time. Fixed rail transit lines may be negatively impacted. People may become very used to the, f the freedom of being able to get picked up at one place and dropped off at another. Um, a fixed rail transit line may be less attractive to them. Maybe bus rapid transit or using um, more flexible tra transit opportunities may be um, a, a good uh, bridge between using an autonomous vehicle and using transit. Um, and electric vehicle charging stations are going to be needed. A lot of communities and ones we work with are now requiring that at least the conduit underground for electric vehicle charging stations be put when parking lots are being constructed so that when the demand increases for electric vehicle charging stations, you can put them in without tearing up the pavement, tearing up the site. It's pretty inexpensive when you're building a new parking lot to just put in, put in some conduit for that. It costs a lot of money to try to retrofit a parking lot by digging it up to bury the conduit to, in order to achieve electric, electric vehicle charging station installation. Um, also, we're thinking about parking lots a little bit differently. This is, um, this is a Whole Foods store in Brooklyn, New York. There's an aerial view, and then what you're seeing is solar collectors. You're seeing um, wind turbines. And the thought here, um, New York, the Department of Parks and Recreation in New York is actually looking at um, 40 of their, of their parking lots and topping them with solar panels because as we see the, the, the use of, of electric vehicles increase, the demand to charge those vehicles is going to increase. And if solar panels can achieve that, imagine what benefits there could be. One, your car in the summertime is going, and even during inclement weather is going to be protected by the covering. And if that covering is generating energy that can then um, recharge the battery in your car. So you get a lot of benefits from that. And then when we look at improving driving, driver behavior, you know, some studies equate being in a car as being similar to being in an internet chat room. You're, you're somewhat anonymous. You're insulated by your car. And how many of you behave differently when you're in your car than you do when you're walking down the street? You know you do it. You know you do it. <laughs> so what's the result? Road rage, use of the middle finger, aggressive driving, and reduce safety. All of those things become somewhat acceptable when you're in your car because you feel like you are somewhat removed from society. You're no longer walking down a street where people are right there. You're in this vehicle going as fast as you can and maybe people won't see you and you may act in a way that's, that's different. Using cruise control or maintaining a consistent speed and increasing your following distance can have a major impact on traffic congestion. And if you go on YouTube and, and search for, for this, there, there's actually folks that are going out there and testing this. This one, this, this one gentleman said, I'm going to see if I can, by myself, have an impact on the daily commute. And he went out and started increasing his, his traveling distance so that if the car in front of him braked, he would no longer have to brake. He could just take his foot off the gas. So the person behind him doesn't see the brake lights come on, so they never tap the brakes. And that chain reaction never occurs because you have that increased following distance. So if we, if we would all drive that way where we would increase the following distance and be at a more consistent speed, we can have a serious impact on reducing congestion. Merging. I, this one is fascinating to me. You know what it's like when a road shrinks from two lanes down to one. The most efficient thing to do is for the drivers just to stay in their respective lanes and merge at the last minute, but it's socially unacceptable, right? You hate it. You're in this long line, someone goes by you and you're like, what are you doing? I've been waiting all this way and you're cutting in at the last minute. Well, it's called a zipper merge and it's more efficient if you wait to the last minute. What we have in a normal situation with a backup is people are trying to merge in here. Wherever they see a gap, they're just going to move. And so drivers are stopping or slowing down throughout this, this, this backup trying to let motorists in. The most efficient way is to wait. And actually, the Minnesota Department of Transportation is actually putting up signs now saying, merge here at the last minute. This is where you should merge. Let's get that zipper merge going. And it's going to take something like this to change the culture. Because right now, it's socially unacceptable. And people do it. People get mad. People get frustrated. Lots of middle fingers start flying. But if you start to change it through this type of um, of signage and education, we may see more of that. So 
I want to conclude with some opportunities for positive change because we've, we've talked about great things that are happening with our streets. We've talked about some problem areas and there's some things I think we can do. In terms of placemaking, zoning, and urban design, we can plan for more places that are walkable and sitable. We can change zoning codes so mixing of uses is allowed and or required. We can adopt form-based regulations like the city of Troy has done in appropriate areas to encourage a pedestrian-friendly urban form, bringing the buildings up to closer to the road. With more development near the street, as we've learned, our speeds can be um, lower, they can be reduced, and pedestrians will be safer. We can provide incentives for more affordable housing and mixed-use projects as infill development. We can modify zoning codes as parking demand decreases. So as we see this change, we can modify our zoning codes. We're doing that in some communities now. We're already seeing a change where parking demand is, is getting less and less due to a number of other factors. Require or encourage conduit for uh, electric vehicle charging stations. We talked about that, so they're ready to be adaptable to change. Increase following distances between moving vehicles. Use that zipper merge approach and educate, uh, educate others that it's not a finger-worthy um, maneuver. <laughs> Implement autonomous vehicle technology when it's been fully vetted. Increase awareness about distracted and impaired driving. Spread out demand using traffic demand management. Try to take your personal trips when it's not a peak hour. Do it in an off-peak time. For work trips, employers need to continue to coordinate their start and stop times, particularly large employers, automobile factories, other large, if everybody's letting everybody out at the same time, we're gonna, as we can see, we're gonna create um, serious traffic problems, but if we can spread the demand out more, we can get better use of, of, of the uh, road network that we have. In school traffic, we need to reconsider our school siting policies. Um, and in a minimum, build non-motorized networks. So even if a school might be farther away, if it's within a reasonable biking distance, you might bike if you've got a safe path to get there. Consider the context of the right-of-way and all of its users, not just vehicle congestion, when we decide whether or not to widen a road. When you have congestion, it's easy to say, okay, we're gonna fix this by going from two lanes to five lanes. That's not always the solution. Sometimes there is a demand there that is being diverted to other streets and once you widen that roadway those folks just come to that roadway that's been widened and congestion returns quickly to a ro roadway even though it has more lanes. Um, we also need to think about all of the users. Is that the appropriate thing to do to widen that road if it's a um, if it's a road that's being or a street that's being used by pedestrians or has the potential to become a pedestrian oriented street. So we need to look at all those users before we make those decisions. Supporting and funding transit, and particularly in those areas where we're trying to get people um, into a more dense situation and be able to get um, customers and employees back and forth from those areas. And then some of the ones that are a little bit more controversial, but I think we still need to explore them, congestion pricing on roads. There are places that are doing that now where if you drive during the peak hour, you're going to pay a fee for that. You're gonna, it, it's gonna cost you money to travel during peak times. That can have a, an impact on when people use the roads. In fact, it does have an impact, and that's something that is somewhat controversial, but it can potentially have an impact in those more extreme situations. Increasing the cost of parking. Parking in a lot of suburban locations is free. You just park, there's no consequence. What if you had to pay to park everywhere you went? Would that change your mode of transportation? Would you think about transit? Would you think about carpooling? Would you think about riding your bike? You probably would because we are all impacted by the cost of, of the decisions we make.